Oh my goodness. Hello, Facebook and YouTube. This is going to be posted on YouTube as well. Okay, so I just um, spent an hour talking to myself apparently because I uploaded. Why does this keep doing that? I uploaded a video. I don't know why it keeps going in and out like that. That's annoying. I uploaded a video. Every time I talk, it does this. What is going on? I uploaded a video of um, live stream. Let me try and fix this. This is getting on my nerves. It's probably going to get on your guys' nerves too. Um, All right, that, that's better. I think it's not going to do it anymore. Let me just check and make sure that the audio, everything is okay because I just spent an hour talking to myself. Yes, that's what I just did. So that was fun. So let me get on here and go on to Facebook and see if this is working properly because... Um, I'm not going to spend an hour, another hour of my time talking to myself. I am crazy, but I'm not that crazy. Um, so give me a minute while I get on this other phone and see if it's working right. Um, I went on to Streamlabs to live stream because I can live stream on both YouTube and Facebook at the same time through the Streamlabs app, but... Um, when I checked the video, I couldn't hear anything. So hopefully, I don't know if maybe I was covering the speaker or what. I don't know. My daughter does uh, go on the Bluetooth a lot. So maybe she had it set to Bluetooth. So I'm going to check this and see if everything is working okay before I start talking. Give me one second, you guys. This phone is super duper slow. So it might take a minute. I hope everybody is doing okay. I hope everybody is being provided for during this time. That everyone has food, water, shelter, electric, heat. Um, let me just annoy you for a second. All right, let me turn on the volume so I can hear. Sorry, you guys. Every time, technology is a pain in the patootie. No matter how many times I go on live, there's always something crazy. Hold on a second. I still don't hear anything. Okay. Yep. It's working. Got a big nose. <laughs> all right. Anyway, so I hope everybody is doing all right. Um. Okay. Let me take this off because if not, you're gonna hear it twice, and I'm not that entertaining. All right. So hello, Facebook and YouTube. I hope everybody is doing well. So yeah, like I said, I just did a whole hour video and I don't think you guys could hear a thing I just said. So that's always wonderful when that happens, right? 
not really um so basically what i was talking about is the times that we're living in right now we're living in some really trying times and we're living in a time where no one's really sure what to do what to think how to react and that's why it's so important for us to um, to rely on our Heavenly Father. And so I'm going to give you a shorter rendition of what I was talking about earlier today. Um, because my throat hurts <laughs> from talking so much to myself. Um... So yeah, I apologize about that video earlier. But I want to let you guys know, we are all going through some really trying times. This is the time that we really need to start showing our brotherly, sisterly love to one another. If anybody has resources or anything that they can help out within their community, do so. Now is the time to start helping people out. Um, whatever you can do. It could be a little, it could be a lot. Whatever it is you can do. If you have bread flour at home, make bread and take it to the food bank. Whatever you can do, do it. Okay? Um, it's it's going to be really hard coming up soon. And I know that there's verses in the Bible that kind of sound that, okay, we're not supposed to be storing up food and stuff like that in this time. But I think the most important thing is that what you do is learn how to rely on God. And I think that's mostly what that verse is talking about when it talks about storing up. Um, that we're supposed to rely on God for everything. We're supposed to rely on God for food, for our shelter, for our family, for everything. And what I was telling you guys about in the other video I made a couple minutes ago, um, before that all went to to the ground um was an instance and when god was teaching me how to rely on him for everything and it was when i was first coming back to him it was about nine years ago and i remember i prayed to god the one night and i said to him i said how do i come back to you like what do i have to do because i kept looking to different churches online, all over the place. What is it that you want me to do in order for me to come back to you? Because I was so scared at this point to do anything wrong. I wanted to do everything right by God because I've already screwed up my whole entire life. Okay. I cannot afford any more mistakes. So what is it, God, that you want me to do? And you know what it was? He said, give everything up. And I said to myself, everything? You want me to give everything up? Like my house, my car, my job. Like, you know, I'm a single mom. Like everything, like everything. And I'm like, no, you can't mean everything. He said, everything. So I did. <laughs> and everybody thought I was nuts. Everybody thought I was losing my mind. Melissa, that's not what he means when he says to give everything up. I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what he meant. When I asked him, I said, my car, my house, my job, my everything. He said everything. So I'm pretty sure that that's what he meant. Everybody thought I was losing my mind. Everybody. I ended up moving in with my mom and my brother they were so vexed with me. They hated me. They hated my guts. <laughs> like, how could you just throw away a good job, a good house, a good car, everything? And for what? For nothing. Like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? I did. I gave everything away. At this time, I started really learning how to a true repentance. I grew up Catholic, so... You know, repentance was you go in, you talk to a priest, you tell him everything, you go sit down, 
you kneel down, you pray, you say so many Our Fathers, so many Hail Marys, and you're good to go. And that's not it. <laughs> that's not it at all. Um, a true repentance is where you pour your heart out to God and you make a true spiritual change within yourself and you never do it again, ever, ever, like never, you never do it again. And then you reprimand anything you did wrong to other people. You go around, you apologize to people, you give back to what you took. You, you make sure that for my life going forward, everybody is going to respect me. Every, not respect me in the, in, the, in the way of like, look up to me, but respect me as she is no longer the same person that she used to be. She's not gonna do this to me anymore. She's not gonna do that to me anymore. She's not gonna be this to me anymore. She's gonna be a whole new person. And they will see it from you because you made amends with each and every single person that you did wrong. And so I learned these things. These were things that I was learning during this process of staying with my mom. It was such a crucial time for me of learning how to really trust in him, that he was going to restore everything back to me, that he was going to take control over my life, and that from this point forward, I would be heading in the right direction. I wouldn't have to worry anymore. I let God have total control over my life. And it's a very hard thing to do. It's very hard, especially in a world like today where people want to control everything. People are so afraid of dying. And the reason they're so afraid of dying is because they can't control it. They have no choice. It's something that everybody has to do. It's something that um, they can't control when it happens. They can't control how it happens. They can't control their situation before they leave. It just one day you, you're just dead. And that's what scares people. They're so used to making decisions for themselves, controlling their whole situation. And this is one thing that they cannot do. And people don't like that. But if you start learning the lessons of trusting in God now, death won't even scare you anymore. Because he will prove to you time and time and time again, you're good, you're told, you're fine, nothing is happening to you. I'm here, I'm right here. You're good, you're fine, relax. It sucks, the times that you're living in, it sucks, but you're good. You gotta trust, pray and obey. Those were, commandments that God gave to me to trust in him to pray and to obey those are the most important things that you could ever do pray unceasingly morning afternoon night keep God in your mind all day long hold your tongue be be more quiet than you do talk. And I'm a total hypocrite because I talk too much. But be silent. Be still. Allow God to really make the moves throughout your day. Go over here. Go do this. Go do that. Allow him to be the one to guide you. You will have the most perfect days. Nothing will go wrong. Because God guided you in every instance of your day. If we start implementing these things into our lives, we will have a perfect life. If we start to really think about our own thoughts and how we feel about people and what we think about people and what we say to people and how we treat people, and we really analyze our own behaviors, those little things will make a world of difference. I never looked at myself as a gossiper until I started analyzing my own thoughts. Maybe I didn't say it outwardly, but I was thinking it. Oh, this lady's crazy. Oh, this and that. Like in my mind, I was saying mean things. In my heart, I wasn't right. Um, 
my perspective wasn't right about the person and the situation. And I started really just at the end of the, each day, during my last prayer, before I would pray, I would really search throughout every aspect of my day and really see what things did I do right today and what things did I do wrong? What things could really use a major improvement? And when I started doing that, I started really seeing that I still had a lot of work to do. Yes, I came, God took me out of the pit of hell and he brought me back into his arms, but there was a lot of work still left to do. The biggest lesson he ever taught me was trusting in him. Everything I had to eat from his hand, I had to, like he restored everything back to me. When I was staying at my mom's house, he restored everything back to me. He gave me my car. He gave me, he provided me money so I could get a car. He provided me money so I could get another apartment. He provided me a job that paid even better than the one before. But everything I had received in the past that I had to give up, it was everything that I received from when I was sinning, when I wasn't right with God. It was from the wrong hands. And so he wanted to restore everything back to me, but from his hands, doing everything the right way, living things the right way. And so I was very slow to even go to a church or to do anything because I said to myself, I need to allow this time for God to be the one to control my life entirely. And if I go to a church, I might go off, go astray again. Why? Because they're going to teach me things from their perspective, from their life, from their mouth, from their heart, from their mind. And I don't need that. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for God's heart, God's mind, God's direction, God's guidance. And the only way that you can get that is a personal relationship with him, being connected with him every single day. A church should not be a place where you get that from. It should be something that you develop every day of your life. It's something that you do every day within every day of your life. If you go to a church, it should be there to uh, to celebrate God and should be to worship God and to be uh, to know the brothers and sisters within your community, to know those who are also working with God, a fellowship and to praise God. But it should not be your foundation of your beliefs and understanding of God. That needs to come from prayers. That needs to come from reading your Bible. That needs to come from uh, spending time, very intimate time with God and allowing him to speak to you. Being very quiet and still so that he can really talk to you to teach you the things that you need to learn. <sighs> When I came back to God, it was not easy. I watch these television shows and these people, they say, and I'm not saying it's not true. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I was just that bad guy. I thought I needed a real hard lesson. I don't know. <laughs> but it wasn't like that for me. Um, I watch these TV shows and these people say how, oh, you know, I came back to God and I got this beautiful house and a husband or a wife and a whole bunch of kids and money and my life is perfect. And I just think, well, that wasn't how it went for me. <laughs> I went through a spiritual warfare. That's what I went through. When I was at my mother's house and I was staying with her, I was going through a spiritual warfare. I remember the one time I was driving home. I went to the go get some groceries at the store and on my way home, there was a flash flood. The water rose all the way up to my window so fast, just in a matter of seconds. And I wasn't that far away from home. I was about five minutes away from home. And I said to myself, I got to get home. The way this water is rising, I have to get home. My daughter can't swim. My mom can't swim that well. I got to get home. Like I had to make sure that they were okay. So I just kept driving in the rain. And if I couldn't drive, I would have swam. I would have done whatever I had to do. But thank God that the water started to go down because there is a hill, a really big hill by my house, behind my house, and it leads to a bunch of stores. And all the water went pouring down and it reached all the way to the top of the, the stores, the roofs. 
And I was able to get home and I got home. I made sure everybody was okay. But I just felt like that was the enemy trying to destroy me. Then another time I fell asleep. And as I started closing my eyes, the Satan, I could see him. He was like this close to my face and he started screaming. He said, you are going to go to hell. I am killing all of you. All of God's children. Like that's what he said. And I jumped up and I started crying and I told my mom what happened. You know what happened the very next day? I'm not even lying to you. You can ask my mom. Sandy Hook. Every day I could feel like the enemy was just trying to destroy my spirit, just trying to discourage me from getting to God. And if there's anybody who's going through that right now, I'm telling you, you have to push through it. Just like God said to Cain, he said, he warned Cain that he was going to want, he would want to kill his brother. And he said, sin is knocking at the door. It's knocking at your door, but you have to overcome it. You have to overcome that sin. When we come back to God, maybe it's not like this for everybody, but this is how it was for me. I had to overcome sin. I had to overcome it. I had to overcome all of those obstacles and hurdles that I created in my own life. So many times we blame everything on Satan. And I'm not saying that Satan is innocent. What I'm saying is, is so many times we point the finger at him, but it was us who created all of those things. We walked away from God. We put all those obstacles between us and God. We prevented ourselves from having a holy and good life. It was our decision and our choice to do so. Anybody can suggest anything to you, but it's up to you to make the right decision. The only one who is responsible for your own actions is you and me. And so I had to overcome everything from my past. I had to overcome all of the demons that I had allowed into my life. I had to overcome each and every single one of them. I never heard any of that stuff when I watched these television shows. Nobody warned me. <laughs> they made it sound like, okay, you just say, God, I'm back. And he says, okay, and it's party time, you know, and everything's great. And it that was not my reality at all. The strongest, that was the strongest lesson though, was learning how to trust in God, how to put all of my faith, everything I ate was from God. The place that I lived in was from God. My job was from God. And when we receive it from God, there's like, you're not even worried about it. It's like, I'm not worried about losing my job. God gave it to me. So if I, he takes it away from me, he'll give me something else. Maybe there's something else he wants to give me. It's not even a big deal. Because you know that everything that he gave to you was pure and good. So and if you, you're not doing anything wrong and you're, you're doing everything according to what you know God wants you to do, you have nothing to worry about. So trusting in God, this is one of the biggest things. And there are some of you who probably know how to trust in God uh, just as good or if not better than me. And in those situations... Keep going. But if you don't know how to trust in God, this is the time to really start to develop that relationship with God of really understanding how to trust in him. Because when we talk about the mark of the beast and we talk about the mark of God, the mark of the beast is doing anything that is against God. The very first time that it mentions the mark of the beast is twice in Genesis. The first time was with Adam and Eve when they did not listen to God. The second time was with Cain. Sinning, when you sin, when you don't listen to God, when you're being disobedient, when you idol worship, when you do any of those things, that is taking the mark taking anything above what God says or tells us to do or not to do, that is taking the mark. But in 
Revelation is talking about a permanent mark, a mark that cannot be erased, a mark that cannot be taken away. And that is the difference because this is a spiritual signing your soul over to the devil type of thing. Okay, this is a whole other level. This is where you are literally signing your soul over to him. So there's, it's the same kind of mark, the mark of the beast and mark of God. Just like when Cain said to, uh, when Cain said to, to God, don't send me out there to the wilderness. What does it mean? The wilderness to the desert. Okay. To the land of the wanderers. Don't send me out there. They're going to kill me out there. Who's going to kill you? The beast. The beast is going to kill me. I don't want to go out there. Don't send me out there. They're going to kill me out there. He's going to die. Anybody, if, if I tell you, you your punishment is to go out to the desert, you're going to be scared. You're going to be scared of what? To die. You know there's no food. There's no water. You know that there's prey out there. There's snakes everywhere in the desert. He was afraid of the snake. He was afraid of the beast. So God said to him, what? He's going to place his mark on him. He said, I'll place my mark on you and no one's going to touch you. No one. You don't have to worry about it. So if you receive the mark of God, that means that you're relying on God for all of your food, for all of your manna. Everything comes from God. These lessons are there and it's not just there for generation after generation, but those lessons over and over and over God, God is reiterating these important lessons to us because the end times is the ones that really have to know this. And when I say end times, it does not mean the end of the world. It means the end of an era. Okay, this is not the first time there was an end of an era and a beginning of a new one. This new era is going to be an, an era of um, where everybody is, they have the chip in them and it's 5G, 6G, there'll be 10G, 20G, everybody's going to die from cancer. It's going to be people who are completely using robots and all kinds of stuff like that. It's going to be all about uh, mechanics and technology. And I don't know about you, but I'm not that impressed by that kind of stuff. I'm not that impressed. I'm more impressed if I go out to see a waterfall. I'm more impressed if I go out into nature. And to be quite honest with you, I'm sick of this man-made stuff. I'm quite sick of it. So why would I want to give up my soul for that? Come on. That doesn't even make sense to me. They're putting us in a position where all of our children, it doesn't matter if you're, because I hear a lot of people talk about how it's the end of America. It's, this is happening a worldwide event. This is not just an American event. So do not fool yourself into believing that the only ones who are going to be affected by this are Americans. Don't cut yourself short. Don't do that. It's going to happen to everybody everywhere. If you keep that mentality, you're going to think that you're safe and we're, not, we're the ones who are going to be in trouble. It, everything starts here first, but it moves all the way to the east. That's the truth. So we have to use our heads in this time. We have to. We absolutely have to use our heads. They're going to use our children. They're going to put us in a situation because they know... And it's just like that situation with parents who are divorcing, where they try to use the child to get to the other person, right? They're going to use our kids to get to us because they know if it's just them coming after us, we're not going to worry about it so much. But if you come for our kids, that's something different. So they're going to say, okay, if you don't do this and don't get your kid the vaccine, then it's jeopardizing their safety, their health, and they're going to take your kids away from you. So now they're playing dirty, right? Now they're going to play real dirty. And these are the things that we have to lean on God for. What do we do as parents in this situation? How do we handle a situation like this? 
I'm telling you, I'm so sick of this nonsense, the way things are going. And I know that a lot of people are, but a lot of people don't know what to do. And I'm telling you, you have to be the type of person who has integrity over obedience. You cannot be afraid to stretch forth your neck. You cannot be afraid to put your neck out there. You cannot be afraid of that. If you are afraid, let's say, for example, when I go to some of these jobs, people will tell me, oh, I don't want to tell, you know, like they'll see their boss doing something bad. I don't want to tell on them because I don't want to get fired. They're afraid. They're afraid to tell on their boss. They don't want to lose their job. So they're afraid to do the right thing. They're afraid to do it. But we cannot be afraid to do the right thing. We must do the right thing. Our soul is counting on it. God said, Jesus said, I'm not going to take you if you take this mark. If you take this one right here, and everybody knows that this is what it is. The Jews know that this is what it is. The Muslims know that this is what it is. The Christians know that this is what it is. Atheists know that this is what it is. There is nobody in this world who is saying, oh, I don't know what's going on. We all know God is making sure that each and every single one of us knows. There has never been a time in all of history where the entire world shut down. There has never been. This is the time. This is the time that everybody has to wake up. God always gives us an out. And I talked about this in the video I made before I went to crap. God always gives us an out. We had Joe Biden, we had Donald Trump, and then we had Joe Jorgensen. Joe Biden, I'm sorry if anybody voted for him. I'm not coming after you personally, but I'm coming after your politics. He's a pedophile. Why would you want a pedophile running your stuff right now? Donald Trump, I don't have a lot to say about him, but he's no Messiah. And we don't need a Donald Trump right now. What we need is a Joe Jorgensen. She is a whole scientist. Did you know that? We had a, God gave us an out, a libertarian who wants to reduce government, that means she would have never made us take the mark of the beast. She would have never forced vaccines on us and our kids. And she wants to reduce pharma, big pharma, who controls the CDC. That was our out. I get so, like I'm so upset. I'm not upset with the people of America. I'm upset that no matter how much God tries to talk to you guys through his people, that nobody seems to listen. Nobody seems to care. Nobody actually applies it into their life. Is left wing, right wing, left wing, life. Stop with that nonsense. It's a wing. It's an arm. What is, it's, it's the same thing. It's designed to do the same thing. And I'm sorry if you're a Democrat or Republican. I'm not a very political person. But in a time like this, I have to be. Because you know what? I got to stop you guys from making the wrong decisions. I'm trying to help everybody. I'm trying to look out for you guys. And I'm not saying Joe Jorgensen was some kind of Mashiach. I'm telling you, it was God's way of giving us an out of stopping the train before we wreck. Now we're into phase two. The first phase was the war. I told you guys the war was coming. When Republican is in office, that means wartime. When a Democrat is in office, it means cartel rules. It means that there's gonna be terrorism. So now we get terrorism. I told my mom, I said, as soon as Obama, and this is not me attacking people personally, I'm attacking politics, so get that into your head. I told my mom, I said, as soon as Obama leaves, I said, watch, all of those school shootings are gonna stop. Where do they go? Where do they go? They just disappeared. Because 
He's a Democrat. That means the cartel rules. That means terrorism. I said, watch, as soon as Trump gets in, wartime. What happened? The invisible war. Why? Because he's a Republican. He rules as king. The red team rules as king. Blue team rules as cartel. What are you a part of your cartel government? It's your uh, IRS. Your IRS is completely illegal and unconstitutional. Did you know that? Completely illegal. But here it is. Why? Because it's a cartel. It's nothing but a bunch of thugs. But God gave us an out. And I'm, it's too late now. It is what it is. But now we're in phase two. We're in phase two of this. So what does this mean? It means major lockdown this time. It means they're going to starve us to death to the point they're not you guys think that they're going to give you guys a lot of money <laughs> get out of here they're not giving you anything there's not going to be any money to give you they already stole everything from us what do you think this is it's just like the i can't say it because i don't want to get flagged you know the two buildings that went this way <laughs> what was that all about you know, I'm on a rant, so I'm just going to say it real quick. I'm going to break it down for you real, real quick. The guy who owned the building, those buildings, okay, he had an inspection. The inspectors told him he had to pay a fine. He had to make all these repairs. He had asbestos everywhere in his buildings. It was going to cost him millions and millions of dollars, okay? He didn't want to do that, so he was thinking about... Uh, Demolishing the buildings. He had a set for demo. Look it up. It's on video. He has it on an interview. You can see it yourself. He said he had a schedule for demo. So then what happened? We, I don't know if you guys remember all the events that were occurring at the same time. But there was many different events occurring. You had the CIA officer who was under investigation for telling secrets. They weren't secrets. And he said it wasn't secret. It was not a secret. He didn't give up any secrets because you could find all that information online. It was on the websites. So he was not giving out secrets. It was public information. But the reason why they wanted to arrest him was because he was calling them out for their conspiracy to steal and destroy from us. And he didn't realize it at the time. And that's why they wanted to arrest him to shut his mouth because he was telling on them without realizing it. The CIA in Afghanistan was telling, they had informants telling them that this attack was going to occur. They notified Bush. They tried to tell him over and over and over and over and over again. He kept ignoring him. The head CIA officer was looking at him like, are you crazy? What is wrong with you? Why aren't you listening to me? Do you not hear what I'm trying to tell you? Because they were all in on it. Circo was in on it. What Circo? Look it up. They control our military stuff. They control all of our documents. They control the visas. Every single airport that they came from was a Circo run, uh, visa run airport. You know who those guys were? They try to say it was Muslim. It was nothing about Muslim religion. These people were poor people. There's a lot of poor people there. And a lot of innocent people were getting arrested during that time when they were looking for uh, Bin Laden. And they were locking up a lot of people. Those people, they locked up. They, didn't, they were doing minor crimes. And they told them that they had to do this. They set them up to do this. It had nothing to do with the Muslim religion. They told these guys, they probably told them that they were going to pay them. Just like they tell these stupid Americans that if you join their stupid, uh, what is it? That, that uh, I call it a cult where they go around and they terrorize everybody. If you join that, that they get paid, right? I guarantee they told them the same thing. They never knew that they were going to die. They probably didn't know that they were going to die. They thought that they were doing a skit or something. 
So they ran the plane into the building, right? But at the same time, they also demoed the place. It was already scheduled for demo. That's why it came out from the bottom. Both things happened. But the plane was not enough to cause everything to go down. Right before all that happened, $7 trillion went missing from those buildings because they stole every dollar that they could. They were under investigation, and so they made sure they, sh they did a Hillary Clinton. They shred everything so there was no proof of anything. Every single one of them you should be so mad at because they stole everything from us. They stole our people. They stole our money. They, you know how much money that owner made off of those buildings? He said it in the interview, watch it. I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the whole truth. Look up who owns the building. Google his uh, interview. You'll hear it yourself. You don't hear, need to hear it from me. He said that he called and made a change to his insurance so that it would cover terrorism. No Jews went to work that day. I love Jews. Don't, don't you think I'm coming for you? I'm not. I don't think the Jewish people knew what was going on, but he was a Jewish person and he called somebody to let everybody know, don't, don't go to work that day, but they sure let the Goyams go. Maybe people heard talk, but you know, nobody, they probably just thought that it was being demoed. I love Jewish people. Don't come for me with that. I'm not anti-Semitic. He made a lot of money off of that. I worked for somebody who tried to burn down their whole McDonald's for insurance claims. Lots of owners, when they're pinched for a buck, will do this. What I'm trying to tell you here is, you guys, they stole everything from us. Right now, they, they, are, they are taking every dollar they can from the Federal Reserve. They're taking everything. They're taking it all. They're giving us little like pennies here and there, some chump change just to shut us up. But what you think that you're going to get from them, you're not going to get it from them. I'm letting you know that right now. You're not going to get what you think you're going to get from them. You're not. They're going to cause us to go into complete and utter devastation so that we are desperate for help. We are yearning for help. We are begging for help. That's where they're going to try and put us. And then they'll give us the answer. And the answer will be to, to eat the pork, to eat the swine, to do the things that God told you not to do, to do it. That'll be the answer. To take the mark of the beast. Please, people, learn how to trust in God. It is the most important thing that you can ever do. Everything that you get has to come from the hands of God. You need to learn that that's one of the most important lessons that you could ever learn. One more time, I'll tell you one more story before I go of trusting in God. When I was a kid, I was almost kidnapped. This man made three attempts of trying to kidnap me. Three. Three. Nobody believed me. I tried to tell my mom she didn't want to listen, nothing. She thought I was exaggerating or wanting attention. I don't know what. Who, who would make up something like that? I don't know. But, you know, it is what it is. So, I was going through a huge depression. I was one of those kids who was always outside, running around, playing. I hated being inside the house. But I was afraid now to go outside. I didn't know if he was outside waiting for me. I didn't know if today would be my day. I wanted to make sure I was right there next to my mom. So at least she could see if he did take me. You know, like she would see it for her own eyes. So I stayed right next to her. Followed her like a little puppy. I was so depressed. God, Jesus, he sent me up to heaven. That night, he sent me up to heaven. And I was in a cloud of light. Sorry, anytime I think about Jesus, like and the things he has done for me, I just start crying. The light started falling away and I could finally start seeing everything. And it was like a, a field like in Ireland, a plush field. The forest is way in the back. And he points to his left and he shows me. 
And there was this beautiful angel. She had this long red hair. She was very tall, very slender, porcelain skin, very beautiful woman. And I said, wow, she's beautiful. And she smiled at me. There was a bunch of children with them. And then there was a male angel as well. And they were bringing the children over to us. And she stood out in the distance. The male angel turned around and walked off. So I guess he brings them to and from. Like he like guards them on their way. And the children started beginning to dance and sing. And they were singing this song. And I looked to Jesus and I said, I know this song. And then I said to myself, I said, I wish I could play with them. And he said, then go. But the way he said it, I thought he was mad at me. I thought he was irritated, like I was making the wrong decision. So I said, no, I'm going to stay here where I'm safe with you. And I held his hand. He said, no, Melissa, it's okay. Go. And as I'm playing with them, I started noticing that they were, I didn't notice at first, but they were people from all over the world. Chinese, African, white, everywhere, everywhere, Indian, everybody. I, at first, you know, every, there was no difference. Everybody looked the same. And I don't mean literally looked the same. But there was no, like, difference between me and them. Or them, the, each other. There was no differences. But I started noticing these are children from everywhere all over the world. And we started dancing and singing. We started running off into the fields. And they started running really fast. They ran into the forest. And I started chasing after them and I got to the forest and I stopped. And I said, I don't know, maybe I'm not supposed to go in there. So I was about to turn around and ask Jesus, but I said, you know what? He said it was okay for me to go. So I started running after them and I couldn't find them. They were much faster than me. I'm looking around and I could hear them giggling, but I'm like, are they hiding from me? Where are they? And I kept running and I ran so fast trying to catch up to them. And then I noticed that they were nowhere to be found. And I got scared and I stopped and I said to myself, you better turn around before you get lost and you can't find your way back. When I turned around, Yeshua was standing there waiting for me with his hand out for me and he brought me back home. When I was a kid, I thought that he was just trying to give me a safe place to play, that he was just trying to, you know, like he saw I was going through a depression. He was trying to help cheer me up and show me that, you know, that he was there for me. And I'm sure all of that stuff is true. But like we talked about before, you know, that's like the elementary, uh, that's like the elementary understanding of everything. It doesn't mean it's not true. It just means that it's like for kids to understand. And as an adult, I started to realize that it was much deeper than that. It was about building a trust and a relationship with him to realize that no matter what, no matter how far I run, no matter how scared I am, he's always right there with me. And he's not just here for me, he's here for you too. The same way he loves me, he loves you and everybody else. Everybody. I'm going to actually tell you another story real quick and then this is going to be it. The second story I want to tell you is walking. He taught me how to walk. And you're going to say, what are you talking about, you crazy girl? He taught me how to walk. Three times he took me up to heaven. And we ended up in these crossroads. It was a city in heaven. It looked like a town. It looked like houses like you, you would see in a town. But it was like, it was a city. It was very beautiful and people were walking and people were all over the place, like just on their way and everybody was happy. It was, it was fine. It was good. It was told, but, um, and everybody was just minding their business and enjoying life. You know, the first time I got there, he was standing there waiting for me and he took me down this one road. We would always go down the same road. He took me down this road and into a dark city. The first time he took me, he was there with me the whole time. He walked me around. We actually went to this one building. There was two boys there and they were playing in the um, parking lot because it was the city. It looked like almost like New York and there was like a fence um, preventing them from going across. Uh, there was a train that went past there, a subway. And so I sat there and I was playing with the boys 
And then Jesus let me play there for a little while. Then he said, okay, it's time to go. Then we started walking. And then I saw a man walking past us. He had his head down and he looked dead. He looked like, like there was something wrong with him. And Jesus explained to me, that's a dead man walking. That's a man who is alive in the earth, but his spirit is dead. That's a dead man walking right there. And he started showing me everything. And he started showing me how to live and how to walk and how to be in this uh, dark city. Okay. So then the second time he brought me there, same thing. He's standing there waiting for me. But this time he takes me all the way to the dark city. He stops right where it goes from light to darkness. And he says, go. This time he wanted me to walk alone. Okay. And this time it wasn't, I wasn't afraid, but it was very uncomfortable. It wasn't the same as the first time where I felt safe because he was right there. He was going to show me my way around. No, I had to do it all by myself. So I walked around the city by myself. I couldn't find my way back out. <laughs> so I had to keep calling. I said, where is the man? Where is the man? Where is that man? And he showed up and he brought me back and he took me back home. The third time he took me, I showed up and he's nowhere to be found. And I'm walking around the city. And I keep asking everybody. I said, have you seen the man? Have you seen that man? And everyone's looking at me like, I don't know who you're talking about. I said, I'm looking for the man. The last time he brought me here, I can't find him. So then this messenger comes and he says to me, he's not coming. And I said, why isn't he coming? He said, he told me he's too busy. He told me to tell you to just do what you did the last time. So this time I had to find the dark city on my own. And I'm looking around and I finally found it and I started walking through this dark city and then I couldn't find my way out, but I, it took a long time and I had to struggle a lot more than ever before because I kept calling on him and he never showed up. So then I ended up finding my way back to this, you know, back to the light city, back to the good city. And I couldn't remember which road. I kept going up and down these different roads that I've seen a hundred times, it seemed like. But I didn't know exactly which one took me back home. So I'm I'm yelling, I'm calling out his name. I couldn't find him. But his messenger showed up again and he showed me the way back. He, he pointed to the direction I had to go and I had to